Pawn Stars welcomes you into the exciting world of the pawn business, where every item has a unique history and every deal is a historical adventure. Today, let's look into the top 10 most prized shotguns ever featured on Pawn Stars. Did you know that some of these guns were used by royalty? Well, what are we waiting for? Let's explore together on this thrilling journey through time, where each firearm has an interesting story to tell. 1. Stephen Grant, 10-Gauge Shotgun The owner of the gun offered the pawn shop owner Rick a Stephen Grant 10-Gauge Shotgun and showed him the considerable hand engraving on the top rib. According to the owner, the shotgun was presented to the Prince of Wales in 1876. A brief history of gunmaker Stephen Grant says that he opened his store in London in 1866, immediately gaining a reputation for his complex creations. Grant's artistry was so admired that he created firearms for royalty, such as Queen Victoria, the Tsar of Russia, and the Sultan of Turkey. After hearing the owner's request and considering the shotgun's historical relevance, Rick considered the worth of such a unique and historically significant firearm. He recognized that getting such a gun may be a once-in-a-lifetime chance, but he also needed to consider its validity and worth before making a choice. It's remarkable that this shotgun was passed down from the owner's mother-in-law and had been sitting in a closet, probably forgotten, for a while. The engravings mentioning the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Edinburgh add to its historical significance and royal connection. The word fowling gun is also fascinating, emphasizing its historical use for bird hunting. These characteristics may considerably improve the shotgun's worth, particularly among collectors of royal artifacts or historical firearms. When evaluating the shotgun's probable relationship to Prince Edward VII, Rick emphasized the rich historical background of British firearms. He showed a stamp showing that the gun was created before 1887, which belongs to the reign of Prince Edward VII, 1901-1910. The existence of the GP symbol with a crown above it indicates that the shotgun was inspected and authorized at the London Proof House, which is an important element that confirms its true nature and quality. A fascinating aspect of British weapons is the existence of two proof houses in the UK, which jointly examine roughly 36,000 firearms each year. This comprehensive testing procedure assures that each handgun satisfies the most demanding safety and quality requirements. In an interesting historical tale, Rick revealed that in 1913, King George V famously shot over a thousand pheasants in a single day, demonstrating the royal family's fondness for hunting and shooting. Despite the passage of time, Grant's legacy lives on as his firm, Atkin, Grant, and Lang, continues to manufacture high-quality shotguns while upholding a heritage of excellence in work and design. Rick shared critical information concerning the shotgun's design restrictions, emphasizing the dangers of utilizing present-day ammo. They noted that the shotgun was originally designed for use with black powder, which expands far slower than modern gunpowder. This significant contrast in expansion rates, with black powder expanding at 10,000 feet per second versus contemporary gunpowder's 100,000 feet per second, implies that shooting the shotgun with current shells might cause it to explode, creating a serious safety concern. Rick provided a fascinating perspective by pointing out that even a simple shotgun associated with the royal family may be interpreted as a type of marketing. This implies that any item related to the royal family, no matter how modest, may have considerable historical or cultural significance, thereby raising its price in the eyes of collectors or historians. Despite Rick's offer of $1,000 for the shotgun, the owner insisted on $800,000 showing a significant gap in value between the two parties. Rick declined the gun due to the obvious price gap, since the owner's asking price much exceeded what Rick considered a fair offer. 2. Ornate French Boutet Shotgun This customer's shotgun, made by renowned French gunsmith Nicolas Noël Boutet, has a long history and superb craftsmanship. It was passed down from the owner's father, a collector of antique weapons, adding a layer of familial significance to its already extraordinary history. Nicolas Noël Boutet, known as the The Artist of Guns, was the director of the Versailles Weapons Factory and worked as a gunsmith for both King Louis XVI and Napoleon 
during the violent era of the French Revolution. This places the shotgun in historical perspective, connecting it to two major characters in French history. The shotgun's walnut hand-checkered stock shows Boutet's tireless dedication to detail and craftsmanship. Furthermore, all components of the shotgun are constructed of high-quality steel, emphasizing its luxury and high worth at the time of manufacture. Rick gathered more details regarding the French Boutet shotgun and contacted Alex Cranmer, an expert and CEO of International Military Antiques. Alex, recognized for his considerable understanding of vintage guns, provided useful information about the shotgun's history and qualities. According to Alex, Nicolas Noël Boutet was a well-known gunsmith in 18th and early 19th century France. Noted for his outstanding skill, Boutet's reputation was so strong that he was appointed royal gunsmith to Louis XVI, the last king before the French Revolution. Regarding the shotgun, Alex speculated that it may be a 50 or 60 caliber. These dimensions do not immediately transfer to current shotgun gauge values. In today's terms, the shotgun is most likely equal to a 20 or 22 gauge. The shotgun is muzzle loading, which means that ammunition is loaded from the open end of the barrel and it has a flintlock mechanism, which was popular in weaponry of the time. It also features a double trigger, with one trigger firing both barrels separately. The shotgun's construction is especially notable, with its carefully hand-checkered walnut wood stock and all metal components made of high-quality steel, displaying Boutet's signature craftsmanship and attention to detail. For antique weapon enthusiasts and collectors, the French Boutet shotgun is a very desirable and precious artifact due to its historical significance, excellent craftsmanship, and distinctive characteristics. Boutet firearms are respected across the world and are prominently displayed in some of the most important institutions, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. These guns are also widely sought after in Europe, owing to their superior craftsmanship and historical value. The shotgun in question is a one-of-a-kind opportunity to buy a piece created by one of the finest French gunmakers of all time. A Boutet firearm's worth is determined by a variety of criteria, including its amount of decoration. In general, even the cheapest Boutet weapons start at about $10,000. However, as the amount of artistry and workmanship rises, so does the cost. The shotgun being analyzed has a decorative element rating of 6 on a scale of 1 to 10, suggesting that it is relatively decorated and will most likely attract a premium price. Despite thorough investigation and analysis, shooting the shotgun at a range is the only way to completely assess its actual value and condition. This procedure is critical because it assures that the shotgun is not just a desirable collection, but also a working and safe gun. The firing procedure might identify any potential flaws or concerns that may impact its value or usage. Alex and Rick meet at the range and begin testing the Boutet shotgun. Alex notices that in direct sunshine, the barrels show extra marks. One side of the barrel reads Boutet, while the other says it was made in Versailles and has a serial number of 322. This serial number, Alex observes, may be traceable, adding a significant aspect to the shotgun's origins and history. To test the shotgun's functioning, Alex loads it with around 50 grains of triple, black powder. They aim at fruit targets, which is a standard method for testing ancient guns. The shotgun fires flawlessly, demonstrating Boutet's artistry and the quality of the materials utilized. Alex emphasizes that weaponry such as the Boutet shotgun are not just useful instruments, but also works of art. Collectors eagerly seek out these firearms because of their historical relevance and workmanship. Alex puts its value at roughly $30,000. After considerable negotiations, Rick settles on a purchase price of $16,000. This price represents the shotgun's condition, historical significance, and current market worth. The deal is completed, and the owner is glad that the shotgun has found a new home with a collector who will value its history and craftsmanship. 3. Black Powder Pegleg Gun Earlier, a gentleman brought in a black powder pegleg cannon, claiming it to be from the early 1800s. Corey, one of the pawn shop employees, is suspicious suspecting it is a movie prop, but he hopes it is genuine. To test its authenticity, Alex joined in, expressing surprise at seeing a peg leg paired with a flintlock mechanism. He referred to this gun as insane because of its unusual design and historical significance. 
Alex explained that the flintlock mechanism works when the flint strikes the steel freeze, causing sparks to ignite the gunpowder and eventually fire the weapon. He observed that British weapons from that era, if positively examined, had the proof mark of a crown with the monarch's initials. In this case, the firearm has the crown symbol of King George, who died in 1820, suggesting that it was most likely made during his reign. Additionally, Alex mentioned that the gun's fabric is machine-stitched, which contributes to its originality and period reality. The rifled barrel of the pegleg gun brought into the pawn store clearly shows that it is a functioning weapon from the early 1800s, not a cinematic decoration. This rifling suggests that the gun was meant to spin the bullet, increasing accuracy and range, which is not common with support firearms. During the sail duration, when naval combat was primarily dependent on cannons and small guns, ships frequently carried people who could perform various jobs. Due to a lack of educated medical professionals, it was usual for the ship's carpenter, cook, or barber to simultaneously function as the surgeon. This historical backdrop suggests the fascinating possibility that the peg-leg cannon was made by the ship's carpenter with materials and equipment found on board. The existence of pipes on the ramrod of the peg-leg pistol is another intriguing element. In a brown best musket, the ramrod pushes the bullet or shoots down the barrel for loading. The presence of pipes on the ramrod of the peg-leg cannon reveals a clever design in which pushing a lever might potentially discharge the weapon. This characteristic enhances the firearm's uniqueness and historical value. Flintlock pistols, like the peg-leg cannon, were utilized in ship-to-ship -ship combat and eventually became the dominant means of fighting. The paper cartridges used in flintlocks included both powder and bullets, allowing for simple loading and rapid fire during heated naval battles or individual fights. Alex successfully tested the peg-leg gun using a little amount of powder and a tiny ball, exerting low pressure to prevent accidents. This careful approach is critical since black powder rifles can be hazardous if not used properly. Rick showed interest in purchasing the gun after being intrigued by its value and historical importance. He assessed its value to be between $12,000 and $15,000, noting its scarcity and distinctive appearance. Following considerable bargaining, the client agreed on a selling price of $15,000. However, Rick was able to negotiate a deal in which he would pay $9,500 for the handgun, demonstrating the discussion skills and enthusiasm for purchasing such a magnificent firearm. 4. A pair of nickel-plated pistols. The percussion cap gun brought in by another owner is an interesting piece of history, representing a significant leap in weapons technology. Percussion cap guns, developed in 1820, revolutionized muzzle-loading weapons by providing a more dependable igniting technique than prior flintlock devices. The fact that this specific firearm belonged to gun manufacturer Henry Edinburgh increases its historical significance. The owner's asking price of roughly $8,000 stresses the gun's historical value, despite its worn-out state. The handle, which was once nickel-plated, has lost its luster with time, and the barrels are rusted and cracked. Despite these flaws, the gun's rarity and link with Henry Edinburgh make it a coveted item among antique firearm users. Alex's description of the gun as a saw-handled pistol adds an extra dimension of intrigue. These handguns are distinguished by their unusual saw-like grip, which provides a unique and comfortable grasp for the operator. The names etched on the firearm, including Alexander Henry, who had a gun business in Edinburgh, Scotland, give the firearm a personal and historical touch. Alexander Henry, one of the most well-known gun manufacturers of the Victorian era, created a unique double rifle for Queen Victoria in 1873, demonstrating his remarkable workmanship and royal support. The firearm sold for more than $42,000 at a 2016 auction demonstrates its historical relevance and collecting attraction. The customer emphasized that Alexander Henry's name plays an important role in the firearm's value, since these guns were designed to mimic a bar of silver, adding to their attraction and visual appeal. Initially asking five dollars to $6,000 for the gun, the customer finally settled on a negotiated price of $3,300 with the pawn shop. 5. Clark and Sherard Pistol 
Next, another owner brought in a Clark and Sherard pistol. The story of Sherard's failed gun enterprises is an intriguing tale of ambition, inventiveness, and finally, tragedy. They had three companies, namely Tucker, Sherard Co., followed by Taylor & Co., and finally Clark, Sherard & Co. These businesses were distinguished by their revolutionary designs and the high expectations put on them. Despite their initial promise, each company eventually failed, leaving just a few guns that serve as melancholy reminders of a past period. One of the most remarkable aspects of this story is the state of Texas's support in Clark and Sherrard's efforts to build a unique clot gun. The state invested heavily in the research, motivated by a desire to build a weapon capable of meeting its military requirements. Despite the significant cost and effort poured, the project faced various challenges and failures. By the end of the Civil War, Texas had nothing to show for its investment, since not a single gun had been delivered. The failure of the Clot Cannon project reflects the problems and difficulties that Sherard has faced in his undertakings. Despite their inventive ideas and high aims, external problems such as economic downturns, technology constraints, and logistical challenges sometimes proved invincible. As a result, just a handful of Sherard's firearms are still in existence today, making them highly sought after by collectors and enthusiasts. Given the rarity and historical significance of Sherard's firearms, it's natural that the owner wanted $40,000 for the handgun. The firearm in question is part of a very rare series, with just 11 known examples in existence. These weapons are said to have been engraved by the renowned lithographer Joseph Paul Henry, adding historical and artistic value to their already uncommon status. The serial numbers of the real weapons in this series were often in the hundreds or 200 range, emphasizing their scarcity and appeal to collectors. However, Alex's acute eye and skill identified a possible problem with the firearm's serial numbers. When he examined known real examples from the same series, he discovered a deviation in the font of the serial numbers on this gun because they did not match those on the certified firearms. This inconsistency suggests that the gun's serial numbers may have been changed or tampered with, casting doubt on its validity. This finding emphasizes the significance of careful examination and professional analysis when assessing historical guns. While the firearm in question may still be worth something as a replica or a one-of-a-kind object, its genuine historical importance and collectability as an original Joseph Paul Henry engraving are uncertain. While the gun's shape and build may be real, the serial number mismatch raises serious issues regarding its history and origin. Serial numbers are important identifiers of antique weapons, providing information about the gun's creation date, manufacturer, and, in certain cases, provenance. Mismatches or changes to these figures might cast doubt on the gun's validity and raise questions about its history. In this case, the difference between serial numbers and known proper samples from the same series shows that the gun's history may not be as obvious as previously supposed. The pawn shop declined to accept the weapon, demonstrating the importance of exact serial numbers in establishing the authenticity and worth of antique guns. The pawn shop's refusal to accept the weapon demonstrates its dedication to authenticity and honesty in all dealings. While the gun may still be a good example of its kind, the increase of changed or mismatched serial numbers reduces its value and historical relevance. This case emphasizes the significance of conducting strict study and inspection when dealing with antique guns in order to appropriately represent their genuine origins and histories. 6. 18th Century Flintlock Pistol The flintlock handgun handed in by the owner is an intriguing item that provides insight into the rich history of firearms. Flintlock pistols have a long history, reaching back to the 1560s in the Netherlands. They were also commonly used in colonial America, adding to its historical value and relevance. The owner's desire to sell it for $1,000 implies that they recognize its worth, but the real value of such an item can only be established by a skilled professional like Sean, who was called by the pawn shop. Sean's research finds that the British military manufactured this particular model of flintlock pistol 
between 1790 and 1820. These handguns were noted for their dependability and were a common weapon among both troops and civilians during this time. However, because of its smooth bore barrel, they had a restricted range of 20 to 30 feet and lacked the rifling that eventually improved weapon accuracy. Despite these restrictions, flintlock pistols were historically significant and are now extremely desirable. Sean says that if the weapon is genuine, the gun's worth might vary between $1,500 and $2,500, emphasizing its historical relevance and collectability among gun lovers. Owning such an item provides a concrete connection to the past, while also demonstrating the workmanship and creativity of the time. Sean made a remarkable discovery when inspecting the flintlock handgun. It was in perfect shape, with no evidence of corrosion or aging. However, his experience led him to the conclusion that it was a reproduction rather than an authentic antique. Several things affected this decision. Sean first remarked that the pistol's symbol, which had a crown over the initials GR, representing King George III, was fitting for the historical period. However, following closer investigation, he discovered that the marking was punched in rather than being hand engraved, as was customary for legitimate firearms from the era. This mismatch raised questions regarding the handgun's credibility. Furthermore, Sean pointed out that real 18th century weapons would have had particular proof markings from the Tower of London on the barrel, showing that they had been tested and satisfied the necessary quality and safety criteria. However, this handgun lacked such marks, indicating that it was not a genuine gun. Despite its position as a replica, the flintlock pistol has significance as a historical reproduction and a tribute to the artistry of the time. These differences in quality and markings caused Sean to believe that the handgun was not from the time and was most likely a recent copy. As a result, its worth as a collectible firearm was evaluated at $75, which is much lower than that of an actual antique. While the weapon may still be valuable as a decorative or functional copy, its historical and collector worth is restricted by its lack of authenticity. Hence, the pawn shop rejected the gun. 7. A Breech Loading Pistol The owner's breech loading pistol is a fascinating item representing great progress in gun technology. This style of pistol, known as a weapon with ammunition loaded from the back of the barrel, was a significant advance over older muzzle-loading firearms. The owner's asking price of $37,500 reflects their appreciation of the item's historical and collecting value. Alex examined the weapon and identified it as the work of Jay Hurst, a well-known gunsmith who provided firearms to British troops during the Seven Years' War. Hurst's shop, located in London, adds to the gun's historical significance and popularity. The introduction of breech-loading weapons was a significant advancement in gun design. Unlike muzzle loaders, which required the shooter to feed gunpowder and ammunition from the front of the barrel, Breech-loading guns allowed for faster and more efficient reloading, resulting in a higher rate of fire. This technological improvement was especially critical in combat settings, when rapid reloading and firing may spell the difference between victory and loss. Hearst's role in delivering guns to British troops during the Seven Years' War lends historical significance to the handgun. The Seven Years' War, fought between 1756 and 1763, was a worldwide struggle involving several of Europe's major powers at the time, notably Great Britain, France, and Spain. Hearst's firearms would have played a critical part in this fight, highlighting their historical significance. Alex's assessment that the pistol was constructed in the 1780s, based on James Hearst's, who is Hurt's son's takeover of the business during that decade, adds to the firearms' historical relevance. The weapon, worth an estimated $40,000, is highly wanted by antique firearm collectors due to its historical context and workmanship. After shooting the firearm, its value reduced somewhat to around $35,000 due to wear and tear. Despite this, the customer held hard to their asking price of $35,000 during talks. However, Rick could only offer $20,000 due to the damage and market conditions. 
The decision not to get the handgun demonstrates the difficulty of determining the worth of historical artifacts. While the weapon has historical and collecting significance, the damage and market conditions eventually impacted Rick's decision not to match the customer's asking price. This example highlights the difficulties of assessing and dealing in antique weapons, where elements like condition, historical relevance, and market demand all play a part in deciding value. 8. Francis Tumblety's Vintage Top Hat and Concealed Pistol One of the more unusual guns brought into the pawn store is a hat with a hidden gun inside. What distinguishes this object is not only its dual functioning, but also its fascinating history. The handgun is labeled and engraved, and it matches the etching on the carrier's side. The carrier has the name Francis Tumblety, a character some believe to be Jack the Ripper. In 1888, Jack the Ripper terrorized London, killing at least five women, all of whom were thought to be prostitutes. According to Rick, Francis Tumblety was born in Ireland and subsequently immigrated to the United States. As a youngster, he began pretending to be a doctor, although having just basic surgical abilities. Tumblety was known to have a collection of uteruses in jars, which is consistent with the brutal nature of Jack the Ripper's killings which frequently involved the removal of organs from his victims, including the uterus, heart, and kidneys. Tumblety later traveled to England, where he became a suspect in the Jack the Ripper killings. Although he was detained on crimes unrelated to the murders, such as gross indecency, he was never officially accused as Jack the Ripper. This hat with a concealed gun not only functions as a distinctive and practical item, but it also has a dark and intriguing background connecting it to one of the most infamous individuals in criminal history. Francis Tumblety escaped to the United States to avoid detection. The owner sought $15,000 for the unique pistol linked with Tumblety, which adds to the fascination of this historical piece. Alex added background by mentioning Tumblety's fondness for flashy clothes and his successful imitation as an Indian herb doctor despite his lack of official medical training. The pistol is a percussion cap box lock handgun with a turn-off barrel, which allows for simple reloading. To reload, turn off the barrel, add powder to the chamber, position a pistol ball on top, and screw it down. The snug fit of the ball would secure the powder in place, allowing for a single shot. During the Victorian era, men would wear hats outside and frequently carried white gloves. These gloves were often placed within the hat, making them a convenient storage option. The hat with the concealed weapon would have been a clever and concealed addition for a man of that age, expressing the necessity for personal defense in unpredictable circumstances. Alex indicated that the gun is worth $2,000, regardless of its relationship with Tumblety. However, given its historical ties to Tumblety, its value would skyrocket to $10,000, a five-fold gain. He emphasized the necessity of ensuring the handgun's operation, since fixing an operable antique firearm may cost as much as the pistol itself. After testing, the weapon operated flawlessly, demonstrating both its functionality and historical relevance. This prompted Alex to raise its potential worth to $10,000, demonstrating its popularity among collectors. Negotiations occurred and a deal was finally completed for $7,200, demonstrating the value put on this one-of-a-kind handgun with a fascinating historical background. 9. Nepalese Bira Gun The owner brought in a Bira gun, which is considered the last hand-cranked machine gun that has never been used in conflict. They're seeking $30,000 for the Bira gun, showing its rarity. Rick, the shop owner, expressed his fascination that he would not see another Bira gun in his lifetime, owing to its rareness. Rick consulted Mark Hall Patton, an authority on the Bira gun and its legality. Rick requested Mark to check whether the Bira gun was made in 1896 or 1897, since any production after 1898 would make it unlawful to acquire. Mark confirmed that Bira weapons were only manufactured between 1896 and 1897, making them allowed to be bought. The Bira cannon fires with each crank of its hand-cranked mechanism, adding to its uniqueness and historical significance. To further authenticate the Bira gun and check its condition, they plan to fire it on the range and meet with Alex. 
most likely to evaluate its functioning and historical relevance. Alex said that the Bira gun has an intriguing beginning story. A man named Gahandra was able to import an American Gardner pistol from England into Nepal. Once in Nepal, he sought to reverse engineer the American Gardner gun, resulting in the Bira gun. As of 2013, just one-eighth of Nepal's 440,000 privately held weapons were legally registered, indicating a large number of unregistered firearms in circulation. The Bira gun experienced various revisions throughout development, the most prominent of which was the addition of a pan magazine. The pan magazine was an important boost to the Bira gun's operation and efficiency. This adjustment, along with other changes made throughout time, led to the Bira gun's reputation as a distinct and sought-after handgun. Alex carried with him the ammo for the Bira gun, which is stored in a pan magazine that can contain 120 rounds. This characteristic adds to the Bira gun's uniqueness, as Alex had said that he had never seen one shoot. They tested its operation by firing the Bira cannon, which functioned flawlessly, confirming its dependability and historical value. Alex calculated the Bira gun's market worth at roughly $27,000, based on its rarity and historical importance. Following talks, they reached an agreement for $20,000, demonstrating the value put on this extraordinary pistol with its distinctive design and historical heritage. 10. Brass Duck Foot Pistols the owner supplied the pawn shop with unique volley pistols made for a British naval officer in the 18th century. They sought $50,000 for this historic pistol and chose to show its operation on the shooting range. Alex, interested in the pistol's history, joined them to supervise the testing. The brass duck foot pistols, also known as volley pistols, such as the one in question, were specifically built for crowd control, which was a critical role during the turbulent 18th century. These handguns were capable of shooting many shots at once or in quick succession, making them useful instruments for preserving order and security in difficult situations. The ability to fire many bullets without having to reload made them deadly weapons. The choice to test fire the handgun not only showed its operation, but also shed light on its historical use and value. The pistol's relationship with a British naval captain heightens its attraction implying a link to Britain's maritime heritage and military power in the 18th century. While the owner's asking price of $50,000 reflects the pistol's rarity and historical significance, talks ended when Rick offered $30,000. Despite the fact that no price was agreed upon, the volley pistol's presentation at the shooting range provided an insight into its history and underlined its unique significance in keeping order and security in difficult times. The volley pistol's design, which was created expressly for crowd control, emphasizes its historical relevance as a means for preserving order in potentially explosive circumstances involving large crowds of people. Volley guns, such as volley pistols, volley cannons, and similar weapons, as mentioned earlier, were designed to fire many bullets at the same time, resulting in a wall of gunfire capable of diverting and dispersing crowds. This feature proved especially beneficial for security forces and military organizations charged with keeping order in highly crowded regions or at major public events. Volley guns are historically significant, not just for their utility, but also for their symbolic meaning as means of authority and control. One important historical incident that demonstrated the efficiency of volley cannons in crowd control happened in 1835 during an assassination attempt on France's last monarch. In one case, it is claimed that a 25-barrel volley gun was used, displaying the deadly power of such weapons in the hands of those intent on causing harm. The existence of British proof symbols on the volley pistol, such as a V and a crown, demonstrates the gun's conformance to the severe quality and safety requirements established by British authorities. These proof stamps acted as a regulatory mechanism to guarantee that firearm makers created safe and dependable guns, lowering the possibility of accidents or malfunctions that may harm users or witnesses. British proof marks were a sign of high-quality craftsmanship and observation to tight production standards. These marks were placed on weapons following thorough evaluation at the London Proof House, where guns were put through high-pressure tests to assure their strength and safety. Only weapons that passed these tests got proof marks, 
showing that they satisfied the quality and safety requirements. For collectors and historians, the existence of British proof marks on a firearm, such as the volley pistol, not only certifies its authenticity, but also gives significant information about its history and origin. These symbols provide a physical link to the past, reminding us of the careful craftsmanship and attention to detail that went into the manufacture of guns during this time period. Alex said that in England, all weapons were tested at the proof house, where they loaded three times the usual quantity of powder into the firearm. If the gun could bear this pressure without exploding, it was marked with a V and a crown, signifying that it had been inspected and passed the test. Each barrel of the volley pistol had been inspected to ensure its quality and safety. They decided to shoot the weapon in order to validate it and analyze its operation. The weapon operated admirably, demonstrating its utility and historical relevance. Alex raised his estimate of its worth to about $45,000, noting its limited availability and historical significance. However, discussions came to a halt when Rick proposed $30,000, which the customer refused. As a result, they did not proceed with the deal. In this video, we explored the fascinating world of some of the most extraordinary and costly shotguns ever shown on Pawn Stars. We've discovered the historical significance of the Stephen Grant 10 gauge shotgun, marveled at the complex design of the French Boutte shotgun, and even examined the mysterious Francis Tumblety's antique top hat gun, each firearm bearing its own distinct and interesting narrative. But the search for even more captivating firearms doesn't end here. Could the next shotgun that's revealed in Pawn Stars showcase an even greater historical significance? Stay tuned to uncover the excitement. Don't miss out on the fun. Like, share, and subscribe. Who knows what incredible discoveries lie ahead in the world of Pawn Stars?